what I want is a driver that also wants to be a part of our journey, that wants to really understands what Williams is about, both the old and the new, and wants that to be at the heart of what they're doing driving-wise. And sometimes that doesn't match up. James, great to be here in the heart of London. You can't miss the Williams fan zone here. And I mean, from what I've seen on the walk up to this, uh, this room above the fan zone, it's gone down very well. I've seen a lot of Americans uh, enjoying the, uh, the Williams cars downstairs. It, exactly that. Yeah, I think one of the unique things that we do, and I'm, I'm really proud of it, is we do these fan zones. So as you said, we're at the heart of London. That's, that's Piccadilly Circus out there. And this is where we are. And we have 20,000, 30,000 people coming through. It's not, it's not small by any stretch of the imagination. And it's, it's about giving back to the fans. I really enjoy these events. You get to meet a whole load of people you never normally would with questions about things that you just have no idea that's the detail I want to go into, but they do. And that opportunity didn't exist in my former place does exist here and it's great to do. What's the strangest thing that someone's asked you that you weren't expecting? Um, uh, I mean, let's see if you can beat it today. The, the strangest thing probably was um, more around some very specific aerodynamics of the underfloor of a Red Bull. Uh, and you sort of thought this is very detailed and very interesting, but uh, separately actually spoke to that individual and explained to them a little bit more about it to help them out. I'll ask you the weirdest question I can think of off the top of my head. One of my questions was going to be, obviously, you know, back in 2009, you were used to working on a, a very small budget and look what you did. You won the championship when Braun GP was a thing. You've kind of talked before about how you're you know, used to working with a small budget and that Williams has a, a lot smaller budget than some of the other teams. What's the kind of the thing that you would least expect to have to scrimp on when you are a Formula One team having to work within a budget? I mean, the, the good thing now is, is I think you're right. The old Williams was definitely on the budget. To explain what we're doing now, we are blowing that out of the water. If I can spend money to invest, we, we will spend money to invest. That's the good news. We're more constrained by the cost cap that, that forces us into an avenue. That, that's okay. That's actually a good thing, not a bad thing. Um, but the strangest thing, I mean, in my time here, the strangest thing I had to spend money on was an etching machine, which is the size of this room uh, required for composites. I thought I didn't even know that damn thing existed. Um, so that's the strangest thing. But the, in terms of saving money in, in that area, I, actually, this is where I'm very good. I, you, you brought up some really good links into it. I think what I'm very good and what my team are very good at is optimizing when you have a small amount to play with fundamentally. And the key there is if you do the same as everyone else, but five years later, you're not going to win races from that. So think differently, think advanced, think how, how you want the world to look like in three to five years, invest there. And it will take time to get there, but invest there. And there's risk. We get it wrong, we fall back. We still haven't got the investments other people have. We get it right, the world changes. You don't make progress without risk. It's exactly that. You do something differently on that note. You are very good at uh, addressing and being held accountable on social media for good things, bad things, indifferent things, strange things. Whose decision was that? Was that your decision? You wanted to speak directly to the fans or was it someone that suggested it and you thought, you know what, that's a great idea. How did that come about? Uh, it definitely came as um, from a team perspective. They've seen some of the work I've done before and we thought, how do we, how do we build this? And it sort of became a, a discussion between all of us. And my view is this, um, as I'm talking to you here, this is me. I'm, I'm the same individual and I always want to be the same individual, which is transparent, honest. I don't care how much it hurts. Let's talk about it. And why not put that out there on social media? Because I am accountable for this and it needs to be known, but here's what we're doing to rectify it, fix it. And by creating that culture, I hope everyone can see the culture we're creating inside Williams is exactly the same thing, but um, just amped up a little bit more. <laughs> And so that, that decision was really made. Um, other individuals brought it to me, completely on board with it. We expanded it out beyond there. And that's what you have today. We talk about transparency then. I'll ask you the question. Anything you want to tell me about any big name drivers? I think not yet. Um, I think, you know, we've been fairly forthright and open on, on who, who we'd like to sign. But that doesn't mean it will necessarily happen. We, uh, we know where we, we place in the grand scheme of things. What I would say is this. What I want is a driver that also wants to be a part of our journey, that wants to really understands what Williams is about, both the old and the new, and wants that to be at the heart of what they're doing driving wise. And sometimes that doesn't match up. Sometimes it does, but that's really important to me. You wouldn't want the team to be seen as a stepping stone. Correct. Okay. Uh, and that's not what I see it at all. Mm -hmm. I left Mercedes to come here. And the reason why I did is not because I'm bored of winning, but rather I want to invest in something that's my own, that has my my fingerprint on it and the fingerprint of a thousand other people working this organization and the fingerprint of Alex that would join us on that journey. That's important to me. It's important to him. And I want that to be at the foundation of a decision. 
you've got a very strong academy, a very small academy, and I know you've spoken before about you know how, how much you believe in that academy. You currently have a driver in Luke Browning that's leading F3. You've got uh, you know Zach O'Sullivan as well at Colapinto in F2. When you're looking at those drivers there, and, and we're talking about you know Carlos Sainz, let's just put the name out there. Do you have to manage their expectations because you know you, you almost show the drivers a pathway, and then sometimes an opportunity is too good to pass up, I guess. Um, Definitely. It requires good discussions. Same way I'm honest about everything, I'm honest about it there. First and foremost, our academy drivers have to be championship winners multiple times over. Simple as that. There's no there's no moving away from that requirement. This isn't about um, being close. This is about you setting a benchmark within your world and your field. And we have some positive news stories. Luke, as you said, is leading the F3 championship um, and brilliant drive in Austria. Actually, when I I was there that morning, watched every second of it, um, did the right actions from start to finish. And in fact, then in the last six races, you could see how much performance he had. He thought, right, I'm off now. <laughs> I've had enough. And and just built a few seconds of gap. Again, same with Franco. Franco has built up across the season so far and has got better and better. And the podium, the second place in Austria is really, a, um, I think, cementing that. With Zach, more up and down this season. There's Monaco, huge highlight. Well done to him. Winning Monaco is special. It's hard to do. And yes, he's a little bit fortunate, but his pace there at that time where he needed it was there, and that's really what matters. So we're fortunate we have good individuals as part of the program. I go back to your place is earned by being champions, multiple champions. That's the real key behind all of it now. And managing that expectation is important. And where we are at the moment is I also have learned with Logan, I hold a responsibility on that. We need to make sure we invest in our drivers and provide them enough time. Otherwise, they're trying to learn on the job and you'll burn them. So even if we had the drivers at the right level, there's an amount of experience gain they have to do behind the scenes, which we're providing, but not there yet. So the clarity to it is I think there's plenty of opportunity to have someone of the likes of Carlos or otherwise in the team, providing a pathway then to our future generations of young drivers. I think we have a few special ones. Yeah, you absolutely do. What do you make of the news today about Oli Behrman? I know it's not exactly a secret in the world of F1. Um, presumably, he would be a driver that, that would also have been uh, on your radar, but it seemed like he had his path set. Yeah, I sp spoke to Fred about it in Australia, just on Sam, where he was and what was going on. I actually <laughs> truthfully thought it was announced in Austria. I'm glad you said it was announced now, <laughs> but I got myself in trouble. Um, again, you know, he's... He's struggling a little bit in F2 at the moment, as is a few other people, um, but that doesn't remove his performance as it took place in Saudi Arabia when he actually had an opportunity. Now, what you're looking for from a young driver is several things, not just how they're performing in those junior series, but how they perform in the simulator and how they perform when you just have a conversation. You're looking for, do they have the growth path acquired? And in the case of Oli, I, I suspect Ferrari have seen what they need in order to be able to invest in him. I think our time is coming to an end. I've got two very quick fire questions for you. Uh, one goes back to Carlos Sainz, actually his father, Carlos Sainz Senior, you know, a guy with incredible pedigree in motor racing. Um, he suggested that, that his son should hurry up and make a decision. Um, do you align with Carlos Sainz Senior or do you think these decisions need time? Feels like he's had a lot of time. I, I think in the case of, so Senior and I have a good relationship. I like him. He's a multiple world champion. There's every reason behind it. He knows what he's talking about. Um, in the case of Junior, I get it. I, to, to some extent, his dream was to be in a Ferrari or in a top team. That's not happening. And you need an adaptation period to it. My goal behind it is simply to lay on the table, this is what we can offer. If you want it, great, we're here. And if you don't, not a problem. We're going to find our own pathway through to things. So his timeline might not be the same as my timeline is the best way of putting it to you. If that option is not taken by him, and that's absolutely fine, does that mean Logan stays, or, or are there option, other options on the table? Do you do you have anything you can sort of allude to there? No, nothing too concrete at the moment. We're definitely um, in discussions with other drivers at the moment. I want to make sure I understand what's in the marketplace and where things are. What I've said all the way along is Logan, it, he's in control of that to a certain extent. He has to be there. He has to perform. He has to be at the right level. There's moments of greatness that really are in Montreal. You wouldn't have seen it, his car was slightly off in terms of specification, but it was a good lap for where it was. But we need that to be a complete picture throughout the weekend. Now, the good news is he's been on the right specification now for a few races and will continue now going forward. Um, his job is grab the opportunity as it is in front of you. Finally, you are a man that likes to deal with winners. We've established this in the last 10 minutes. We speak to Zach Brown quite a lot on Talk Sport, and he's very big on the fact that he could beat Christian Horner and Toto Wolff in a race, in a car, obviously a big racing guy. I know your racing career maybe isn't as esteemed as those guys. You know, you're sort of the great manager, the great mind, the great strategist. What could you beat 
every other team principal in, in Formula One in? Is there something, a sport? I know you like to run around the track. There's got to be something. I think Andrea could be quite quick, but I, I think running or cycling, I've probably got a fairly good opportunity. I'm not sure I see Zach on a bicycle at the moment. Um, uh, I can fly helicopters. Don't think anyone else can do that one. So um, I tell you what, choose your mode of transport and we'll cross England, see who gets there faster, I'm pretty sure. Uh, but you have to be in control. No one can help you. Um, I think I, I wouldn't mind a motor race, actually. Let's see where we get on with that. Let's get this set up. Zach, Toto, Christian, myself. I'm not sure who would come out on top. What vehicle would you be in? Well, I think if you want a fun race, you've got to get rid of quite a bit of the downforce. So um, just, just put us all in the same. Citroen C1. I mean, that, there's going to be none of those cars left at the end of the race. You know that. But it'll be a fun race. All right. I look forward to it. Uh, James, thank you very much for finding time. I know it's a very busy week for you. Uh, best of luck this weekend. And we'll wait for news on your driver lineup. There you go. Thanks thank very much. On AM, on DAB, via the TalkSport app, and on your smart speaker. TalkSport.